Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Austin Peterson here, former presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. Welcome to the Freedom Report live stream. If you're watching this now, you're watching it on YouTube, then you are live. Congratulations. You're watching this show as it's meant to be watched live on YouTube at our YouTube page, youtube.com slash A-U-G-G-Y-P. Augie P. That's me. But if you're watching it on Facebook, Womp womp. Sorry, you're watching us later. If you want to tune into our live streams, the normal schedule is Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have one last night, so I'm making up for it tonight on Tuesday. So if you're watching us live, really grateful that you managed to file in and join us. But if you want to catch them live and you're just seeing this on Facebook, do me a favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Augie P. That's A-U-G-G-Y-P. Augie P. That's me. That's my nickname. So anyways, thanks for tuning in tonight. We've got some breaking news. Donald Trump has named his pick for the vacancy on the Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court will be filled if confirmed by the Senate by man Neil Gorsuch. Uh, and we've got lots of people very excited about this, mostly on the right wing, of course. Uh, Donald Trump has picked someone that is to appeal to people who were fans of the former uh, person who sat in this uh, on the bench in this position, in this seat. Uh, and that person, of course, was Antonin Scalia, who passed away last year <clears throat> and is now billed to be replaced. And now I've done my research on Neil Gorsuch, as much information as there is out there on the man. Uh, and it does appear, of course, that there are some pros and cons. Many people are disappointed by the fact that my former boss and good friend, Judge Andrew Napolitano, would not be picked. Of course, I was not expecting that he would be. But there were a lot of rumors that were flying around because of the fact that uh, Senor Paolo Napolitano was meeting with the president-elect in Trump Tower to discuss the potential Supreme Court picks. Uh, of course, I knew that that was not going to happen for many reasons. One, I think it's because the, of the fact that uh, Mr. Napolitano, unfortunately, works at Fox News, which means that uh, that would probably be a big hindrance for him to get past any kind of Senate confirmation hearings. And also the fact that Senor Napolitano <clears throat> also uh, was a superior court judge uh, and was not on a high court or circuit court. Uh, generally that you have to sit on a higher court before you can be considered qualified to be elevated to a position such as the Supreme Court. It wouldn't be out of the ordinary. It wouldn't be impossible for that to happen. Uh, but another negative, of course, would have been that Mr. Napolitano was 66, uh, is 66 years old and uh, most likely the conservatives who were advising uh, Mr. Trump or President Trump were wanting someone who was much younger. Uh, Neil Gorsuch is 49 years old, which would mean that he would have uh, decades to serve on the Supreme Court and to shape American jurisprudent, jurisprudence for, uh, for, for the years to come. So I think that that is probably most likely uh, what led to um, his, uh, his pick, uh, Mr. Trump picking him for the Supreme Court vacancy. Of course, the Democrats are vowing to try and do everything they can to block whoever Mr. Trump puts forward as a Supreme Court pick. Uh, so there'll be some wrangling back and forth, but most likely that he will be confirmed. So I've pulled some information, some biographical information, some historic information on Neil Gorsuch. And we're going to take a look at his record. Uh, the question I think most that's on most people's minds who would watch this show would say, is he a libertarian? Well, the answer to that question is no, not a libertarian, not in our sense, not in the taxation is theft sense. Uh, but he's about, he's the closest you can get, I think, uh, on a libertarian scale, uh, on a conservative scale, and, and not quite have jumped over to the whole, you know, uh, privatize the roads, abolish driver's licenses kind of a, of a libertarian that you would meet at a libertarian national convention. Neil Gorsuch would never get up on stage and dance naked in front of a crowd. So he's not, that means he's not a libertarian, right? <laughs> I'm killing myself, guys. I'm killing myself. Ugh. I wish I had a live audience because that would be way more fun and you guys could laugh with me and I don't have to feel like a weirdo, crazy person sitting up here laughing at my own jokes. Uh, <clears throat> anyways, so a constitutional uh, originalist? No, not really. Uh, more of a textualist. And there's a difference between an originalist and a textualist, although it's a mild difference. And, and I'll be discussing what a constitutional textualist is. This is uh, what uh, Justice Antonin Scalia believed and uh, what Neil Gorsuch uh, uh, pertains, what he, what he um, ostensibly is as well. So I'll give you an explanation of what a constitutional textualist is and what that means. And then uh, we'll, talk about, um, we'll talk about his philosophy after I discuss uh, the, uh, so the court cases that he has presided over, what his opinions on those court cases were, and uh, yeah, then we can get into it. So I'm going to go ahead 
and pull this up. The first person who uh, came to my mind who I saw, I uh, wanted to know what it is that, that they thought about the Supreme Court pick, of course, was Senator Rand Paul. Uh, and it appears that he gets the, the, the thumbs up from Senator Rand Paul, which is, you know, he's, you know, I don't always um, like to make my arguments from authority, of course. You know, I don't, I don't believe that someone's a good pick just because this person thinks they're a good pick, but it's generally a good, uh, it's generally a good compass for me. So if Judge Napolitano uh, made a statement, which I'm sure he will either tonight on Fox News or tomorrow, uh, then that will definitely shape my opinion of the man in terms of what I, what I think of him. But Senator Rand Paul wrote today on Facebook, he said, I congratulate President Trump for nominating a conservative jurist with outstanding credentials and experience to the Supreme Court. Uh, Rand Paul says that Judge Gorsuch is a worthy successor to Justice Scalia, a committed originalist, a strong defender of religious liberty and states' rights, and a bulwark against the administrative state. I look forward to working with my colleagues, colleagues for a speedy confirmation and to having another justice who will defend the Constitution. So that right there um, makes me happy. I'm glad that Senator Rand Paul likes him. If Senator Rand Paul had come out today and said, absolutely not, I would not confirm this, and he voted against him, well, there would probably be a good reason for that. I tend to trust Rand Paul's judgment on these matters, uh, and that's why, you know, if, for example, if I were ever a senator, then he's someone who I would... Uh, confer with and work with on issues because he's the one that I agree with the most <clears throat> of all of them. Uh, but I, I wanted to see for myself, of course, trust but verify, as uh, that old Republican Ronald Reagan would say. So I wanted to make sure that I was uh, researching his, his viewpoints for you, and I want to bring this uh, story to light. This is from uh, NPR. Uh, President Trump has selected federal appeals court Judge Neil Gorsuch to fill a Supreme Court seat that has been vacant for almost a year, setting up a blockbuster confirmation hearing that could put the new White House's domestic political agenda on trial in the U.S. Senate. The selection fulfills an early campaign promise by Trump to nominate a solidly conservative judge with a record of strictly interpreting the U.S. Constitution. Gorsuch, who is 49 years old, sailed through an earlier confirmation process for a spot on the federal appeals court in Denver. Only weeks after his nomination in 2006, the Senate confirmed him by voice vote. The American Bar Association has rated him as, quote, unanimously well qualified at the time. Gorsuch has a sterling legal pedigree. He clerked for two Supreme Court justices, Byron White and Anthony Kennedy. He also served as a clerk on the second most important appeals court in the country in Washington, D.C. for conservative judge David Santelli. Like Justice Antonin Scalia, whom he's going to replace, Gorsuch has cultivated a reputation as a memorable and clear author of legal opinions. He also considers himself to be an originalist. There is a bit of a, of a, a definition in terms of that. We'll discuss that in just a moment. Lawyers who practice before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, where Gorsuch currently works, said he is a popular and approachable judge. SCOTUS blog, the leading Supreme Court blog, describes some of Gorsuch's parallels to Scalia as, quote, eerie. Quote, he is an ardent textualist, like Scalia. He believes criminal laws should be clear and interpreted in favor of defendants, even if that hurts government prosecutions. Let me repeat that again for you, ladies and gentlemen, because that is very important, and that is a very libertarian instinct, and it's the kind of thing that makes us go, oh, yippee, okay, this is good news. He is an ardent textualist, I'll explain what that is in a moment, but he believes that criminal laws should be clear and interpreted in favor of defendants, even if that hurts government prosecutions. Well, hear, hear, rah, rah. That's what we like to hear, ladies and gentlemen, because that's the kind of thing, that's where you know that you are in a, a, a libertarian legal environment where the burden of proof is on the government to prove their case and that the defendant has all of the rights on their side and that they should have the assumption, presumption of innocence and of liberty. He is skeptical of efforts to purge religious expression from public spaces, like Scalia, good. He is highly dubious of legislative history, like Scalia. And he is less enam than enamored of the dormant Commerce Clause, like Scalia. Who said that the Commerce Clause was dormant? This is NPR. Take it with a grain of salt. Among other rulings that came to national attention, Gorsuch cited in favor of religious freedom claims made by the Little Sisters of the Poor and the owners of the craft company Hobby Lobby who challenged language in the Affordable Care Act that required them to pay for contraceptive, contraceptive coverage for employees. The Supreme Court backed those Hobby Lobby challengers in a divided vote in 2014. 
That's very good because uh, I saw today on Twitter the liberals are absolutely freaking out that they're saying that he is against abortion rights. Well, the problem is is that's absolutely not true because what, from what I have read of Mr. Gorsuch's opinion is that he actually doesn't want to overturn Roe versus Wade. Now, I could be wrong about that because I haven't been able to find hard confirmation on that. So this isn't an alternative fact. This isn't fake news, ladies and gentlemen. This is just what I've read. So let's make sure that that's confirmed. But I'm not reporting it as true just now. But as at the moment, it seems as if he sides with Little Sisters of the Poor, with Hobby Lobby, not being required to offer a contraceptive if it goes against their religious beliefs. And that is absolutely a religious freedom that they should enjoy. Uh, employers should have that right to do so. You don't have to work at uh, Hobby Lobby if you want to get contraception. Contraception is not that expensive either, by the way. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that he's against abortion rights, uh, especially, well, I wouldn't call abortion a right perhaps, but I would say it, would, it doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to do things like overturn Roe versus Wade, because as, as a matter of fact, I've actually seen the opposite being reported today. So that's something that we want to follow up on and make sure that we understand, because he may not be this sort of pro-life uh, conservative that most hardcore pro-lifers would like. I think most hardcore pro-lifers tend to believe uh, that the Supreme Court case of Roe versus Wade should be overturned in favor of federalism, meaning that the states should have the right to ban abortion if they decide, and that it should not be a federal one-size-fits-all protocol. Uh, and to my knowledge, Neil Gorsuch has not supported an overturning of Roe versus Wade. So that could mean that he would not be uh, a suitable pick for the, the sort of rabid pro-lifers who want that to be overturned. However, he did side with Little Sisters of the Poor and with Hobby Lobby uh, in terms of their right to refuse to provide birth control through their medical plans. Listen to this. In a lecture to the Conservative Federalist Society in Washington more than three years ago, Gorsuch elicited laughter from the audience as he quoted from the 1853 Charles Dickens novel Bleak House, refer referencing the work of the late novelist David Foster Wallace and discussed irony and the law. Quote, Like any human enterprise, the law's crooked timber occasionally produces the opposite of the intended effect, he said. We turn to the law to earnestly promote a worthy idea and wind up with a host of unwelcome side effects that do more harm than good. We depend upon the rule of law to guarantee freedom, but we have to give up freedom to live under the law's rules. Fantastic. Off the Bench, Gorsuch in 2006 published a book called The Future of Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia, criticizing the practice and defending the, quote, intrinsic value of human life. He also contributed to the law of judicial precedent last year. So what is, let, let's look back at that. For most libertarians tend to believe in, in the, uh, the right of the individual to decide to end their life if they decide. Uh, but he called the future of assisted suicide uh, and euthanasia, he criticized the practice. So it, appeal, it appears as if Gorsuch would take a traditional conservative view on this, uh, that you ha if you have a right to life, then that right to life must be guaranteed by government, which is very interesting because it tends to conflict with so many of the other conservative viewpoints. Um, of course, if you have a right to life, um, take a look at what happened, for example, in Florida with Governor Jeb Bush. When Jeb Bush was a governor, um, his right to life was that <clears throat> he believed that the government should force the feeding tube on into Terry Schiavo. Does everybody remember the case of Terry Schiavo? Terry Schiavo, who was, uh, they found out after she died, of course, that she was legally brain dead. But Jeb Bush actually mandated that the government step in and force a feeding and breathing tube onto her uh, because despite the wishes of her husband at the time, uh, the, uh, the state stepped in and, and forced her to remain alive just against his own wishes and what he thinks his wife, Terry Schiavo, might have had. Now, that's really the question there, of course, with the libertarian approach perhaps versus the uh, the conservative approach, if, if the right to life is the mandate to life, meaning that the government will force you to stay alive, uh, that is a, at odds with the libertarian understanding of euthanasia, which is simply that if you own your life, you own your body, and you should be able to decide what goes into it, perhaps you might have the right to end your own life. And that is a question of contention, and it appears that the uh, Supreme Court pick would be a, a traditional conservative in this and would oppose it. Would that mean, of course, that he would uh, uh, side on Jeb Bush's side and force the feeding tube onto people who are, uh, who are ostensibly brain dead, people like Terry Schiavo? Well, we have yet to determine that, but, the, but the, uh, that, the answers to that question most likely would be found in his book, 
the future of assisted suicide and euthanasia. Very interesting and something that libertarians definitely need to consider uh, when taking a look at his whole record, right? Right, okay. Uh, so there are some other criticisms that we have. Um, uh, there are uh, some issues in terms of the Second Amendment, in terms of uh, uh, freedom to uh, have self-defense, and I'm going to pull that up for you as well. I want to make sure that you guys get a good uh, overall analysis of this Supreme Court pick, because there is a reason for pause with his record when it comes to Second Amendment rights. Judge Gorsuch joined in one opinion, this is United States versus Rodriguez, uh, which causes them to, us to have some concern about his understanding of the relationship between the government and an armed citizenry. To be fair, Judge Gorsuch did not write the Rodriguez opinion. His colleague, Judge Bobby Beldock, was the author. Nevertheless, Judge Gorsuch joined the opinion of the court. He could have filed a principled dissenting opinion or even a concurring opinion agreeing only in the judgment. But listen to this. The facts of the case are these. A New Mexico policeman observed Mr. Rodriguez, a convenience store clerk, carrying a concealed handgun. Carrying a concealed loaded handgun is illegal in New Mexico without a permit, but legal if one has a license to do so. The officer, upon seeing Rodriguez's handgun, detained him then, ask, acting first and asking questions later, forcibly disarming Rodriguez. After finding out that Rodriguez did not, in fact, have a license to carry and indeed was a convicted felon, the officer placed him under arrest. Of course, hard cases make bad law, but the precedent from Rodriguez's opinion will affect police-citizen relations in New Mexico and possibly elsewhere in the Tenth Circuit for many years to come. Not bothering to figure out the legality of Rodriguez's firearm before detaining and disarming him, the officer's initial actions would have been the same even if Mr. Rodriguez had been a lawful gun owner. According to the Tenth Circuit's opinion, the police are justified in forcibly disarming every armed citizen based on nothing more than the presence of a concealed firearm. This allows the police to treat every law-abiding gun owner like a criminal, which in many cases we have seen includes rough treatment such as grabbing him, twisting his arm behind his back, slamming him down on the ground, and handcuffing him. Far too many police officers do not like anyone to be armed other than themselves and have taken it upon themselves to intimidate those who dare exercise their Second Amendment rights. Under the Rodriguez decision, only after being forcibly disarmed and detained would a citizen be entitled to demonstrate that he was lawfully exercising his Second Amendment rights. The circuit court at the time based this decision on Terry versus Ohio. Have you ever heard of a Terry stop? The stop and frisk doctrine. One of the holdings from Terry is that if the police have, quote, reasonable suspicion that a person is both armed and dangerous, they can temporarily seize his weapon in order to keep everyone safe. Of course, anybody with a smidgen of common sense knows that just being an, quote, armed, law-abiding citizen does not also make a person dangerous, any more than a police officer with a gun is considered dangerous. But unfortunately, the Rodriguez decision allows the police to conflate the two concepts and to treat all armed persons as if they were automatically dangerous. According to the panel opinion joined by Judge Gorsuch, the mere presence of a loaded, concealed firearm, quote, alone is enough to justify the officer's action in removing the handgun from defendant's waistband for the protection of himself and others. To be sure, Rodriguez did not raise a Second Amendment claim before the court, and the court cited various Fourth Amendment cases to justify its bad decision. But judges cannot completely hide behind this precedent. Judge Gorsuch was free to express his disagreement with these precedents, even if he felt obliged to concur in the result. But that is not what he did, okay? So that's, that's something that we have to consider when looking at the overall argument for and for arguments for and against Judge Gorsuch and his upcoming confirmation. So we are hoping that there will be some senators who will quiz Mr. Gorsuch um, and uh, hopefully Rand Paul, despite the fact that he stated that he agrees with him and would confirm him, I hope Rand Paul asks Judge Gorsuch some difficult questions on the Second Amendment because to me, you can't be a conservative and, and argue against Second Amendment rights. And we do all have the right to bear arms in this country and that's something that libertarians and conservatives should agree on. So that is the, probably the big major criticism that I would say that libertarians would be interested in and conservatives should definitely hold his feet to the fire uh, and we'll see how he legislates, or excuse me, not legislates, how he uh, makes his determinations from the bench. Now, let's just, just discuss, since we're at the very end, I do want to discuss with you so you all have an understanding of what is textualism when it comes to an interpretation of constitutional law. Uh, textualism is what, uh, he, a textualist 
is what uh, Neil Gorsuch ostensibly may be. And so I'm going to recite to you the definition of what textualism is, get a little bit into it so that you can all have some background on what it would mean in terms of your legal philosophy. And uh, yeah, and that way you all be a little bit more educated on such. Textualism is a formalist theory that primarily interprets the law based on the ordinary meaning of the legal text and not considering non-textual sources such as intention of the law when passed. The problem that it was intended to remedy or significant questions of the justice and rectitude of the law. So let's, let's explain here. The textualists will look at the statutory structure and hear the words as they would sound in the mind of a skilled, re objectively reasonable user of the words. Okay? The textualist does not give weight to legislative history materials when attempting to ascertain the meaning of a text. Textualism is often erroneously conflated with originalism, right? So both NPR and Senator Rand Paul uh, made a mistake when they stated that Judge Gorsuch was an originalist uh, because an originalist means original intent. And a textualist says the plain language of the words. So if you're interpret, if let's say you're a judge and you're interpreting uh, a law, in order for if you're a textualist, you're going to take the plain language of the words and say, well, the words mean what they what they mean. But an originalist is going to say, well, what did the person who wrote those words intend? Right? So many people who are originalists will say, well, what did the Founding Fathers intend when they wrote the Bill of Rights? What did they intend? Well, a textualist may, who can be separate from an originalist and say, well, I'm not looking at what the, uh, what the author of that law intended. What I'm looking at is what the text says in plain words. So if I, uh, objectively speaking, stating a, exactly what the words mean, the words mean what the words mean. So if you speak those words clearly, then they, they mean what they are. Not, so I, so, so if, um, if it is to be believed, Neil Borsig is a textualist, then that simply means that he's not going to take the intent of the person who wrote the law. He's going to take the objective words, which is just an interesting form of... of um, uh, of explaining what uh, his legal philosophy would be. The textualist does not give way to legislative history, of course. It's erroneously conflated with originalism and was advocated by Supreme Court justices such as Hugo Black and Antonin Scalia. Uh, Scalia staked out his claim on this in the 1997 Tanner lecture where he says, it is the law that governs, not the intent of the lawgiver. Okay, let me repeat that again. It is the law that governs, not the intent of the lawgiver, right? And that I, I was echoing this the other day in my defense of the 14th Amendment because I argued that the 14th Amendment means that all persons uh, within U.S. jurisdiction are entitled to equal privileges and immunities, equal protections under the law. All persons, meaning any person, including the unborn perhaps, or including someone who is not a U.S. citizen. The originalists were trying to say, but, but the 14th Amendment was never intended to apply to people who were not slaves, because when the 14th Amendment was originally written, it was intended only to apply to non-citizens who were slaves in order to make them citizens and so that they could not have their privileges or immunities abridged and so that those non-citizen slaves would then be right. But we don't care about what the person who wrote the legislation intended. That is an originalist doctrine. But a textualist document doctrine, if you look at the 14th Amendment in the plain language, it says any person who is subject to U.S. jurisdiction, right? So that is a textualist argument versus a, a, an originalist doctrine, right? So the originalist would say, oh no, well the 14th Amendment only applies to people who were slaves at the time, therefore this law is no longer valid. But, but subsequent interpretations by, the, by uh, the Supreme Court and by other lower courts of the 14th Amendment have upheld the textualist definition of the 14th Amendment. And that makes some conservatives upset and angry, but it makes libertarians and some liberals happy because it, in, in a sense it becomes what they would call judicial activism. And there is quite a bit of contention over whether or not judicial activism is warranted or not. Um, many legal, legal firms, libertarian legal firms, people like the Institute of Justice, argue that yes, we should use textualism and judicial activism if it, if it is for libertarian ends. Uh, the originalists would argue, no, only the original intent of the law as it was written would be what we should uphold. So that is a, a debate. And so that, as long as you understand the terms, ladies and gentlemen, then I think you're going to be more informed in how you can make your, uh, how you can make your decisions about whether or not whether or not you believe uh, a law is constitutional, whether it is legal, or whether it is moral. 
Uh, and that's it, ladies and gentlemen. What, are, what do you think about Neil Gorsuch? I'm very interested to hear what you have. We have, a, wow, a couple hundred people watching the live stream. That's fantastic. Much more than we usually get on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching the Freedom Report live stream. I'm your host, Austin Peterson. If you want to find out more about this, you can come to the libertarianrepublic.com or Liberty Viral, our sister site, where it's your home for economic freedom and personal liberty. If you want to get your MIG taxation theft hat, again, only for the real libertarians, you can get this and other cool products at threadsofliberty.com. It's the AP collection. That's threadsofliberty.com. Make taxation theft. Again, you can get your sweet hat. I've been seeing people out at conventions over there with their hats, and it's kind of cool because they're like, Trump supporter? No. Libertarian. <laughs> and it, it's a lot of fun. And it's the kind of thing that makes people do the double take. And then, you know, you can start a conversation about why taxation is theft. And then you go on a date and then you get married and you have little libertarian babies. Won't that be great? Yeah. And you could say, Augie P did it for me. So check it out. Threadsofliberty.com. I'm very grateful for everyone for watching. If you're watching this on Facebook, now do us a favor. Share us with your friends on your Facebook timeline. We're very grateful. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day and stay free.